called the Kiev to give the lecture here and there to the Mystic Institute and the Planck Institute here at the Black Friars in Oxford. Dr. Colbert is a senior lecturer and the director of research in the School of Divinity at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. His principal research interests are theology and the arts, especially Dante, as well as systematic and historical theology, with a particular focus on Aquinas. So today's lecture is the uh, text section of those subjects in any way. Uh, his latest book was published last year and was entitled Dante's Christian Ethics, Purgatory and its Moral Content. And also, I should add that uh, Dr. Corbett taught me at St. Andrews during my undergrad degree and was my dissertation supervisor, uh, taught me about Aquinas and Dante. So, on a personal note, it's, it's good to have you here as well. And then, two uh, small uh, points. There is a handout, so uh, if anyone didn't have the handout, please uh, go and get one. Um, we'll be going. And then the, the fire exit's in the corner over there. So, thank you. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Corbett. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liam. Um, uh, thank you, Liam. Um, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, um, Brother Albert, as well, for um, this invitation and to the um, Dominican Friars for putting up with me um, uh, over the past couple of days. It is a great pleasure and privilege um, to give this talk at the Thomistic Institute and the Aquinas Institute, and especially so in the 800th anniversary of St. Dominic's death and of the first establishment of the Dominicans here in Oxford in 1221 and in the 700th anniversary of Dante's death in 1321. In Dante's Paradiso, in the heaven of the sun, the heaven of the lovers of wisdom, the Franciscan St. Bonaventure extols St. Dominic as a lover of and warrior for the Christian faith. The army of Christ, the church militant, which cost so much to rearm the blood of the martyrs, was marching behind the standard, slow, fearful and scattered. When the emperor who rules forever, God, sent to the aid of his bride, the church, two champions, St. Dominic and St. Francis, by whose deeds and words the straying people were brought to themselves. In Calaruega was born the amorous lover, of the Christian faith, the holy athlete, benign towards his own, but harsh to his enemies. And from the sea of St. Peter, he asked permission to fight against the errors of the world to defend the seeds of faith. To the Dominican St. Thomas Aquinas, by contrast, Dante gives the critique of those of his fellow Dominicans who had already strayed from the path set by their founder. I was among the lambs of the holy flock that Dominic leads by a path where one fattens well if one does not wander. But his flock has become greedy for new foods so that it must spread itself over diverse mountain pastures. And the farther his roaming sheep wander from him, the more they return empty of milk to the sheepfold. To be sure, there are those who fear the harm and gather close around the shepherd, but they are so few that their hoods require but little cloth. Unfaithful Dominicans, Dante suggests, wander and stray in the vices of idle curiosity or even the pursuit of wealth, honours, worldly vainglory or other goals. By contrast, faithful Dominicans fatten well their souls on theology and holiness, and return full of milk to the sheepfold, as Aquinas himself preeminently showed, famously beginning his Summa Theologiae with the words, because the professor of Catholic truth ought not only to teach the proficient, but also to instruct beginners, according to the apostle, as unto little ones in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not meat. We purpose in this book to treat of whatever belongs to the Christian religion, in such a way as may tend to the instruction of beginners. Although in characteristic humility, Dante's Aquinas simply describes himself as one of St. Dominic's faithful sheep, Dante gives him the place of greatest importance amongst the lovers of wisdom in the heaven of the sun. 
In the Commedia as a whole, only the three main protagonists, the pilgrim Dante himself, Virgil and Beatrice, are afforded more lines or more words than Aquinas. In his prose work, The Convivio, furthermore, Dante, citing the Summa Contra Gentiles, models himself on Aquinas as a defender of faith and fighter of heresy. I model myself on the good friar Thomas Aquinas, who entitled one of his works, written to refute the arguments of all those who deviate from our faith against the Gentiles. Dante then clearly saw Aquinas as, in the spirit of his founder, a lover of and warrior for the Christian faith, and perhaps even saw himself in similar terms. From Dante's perspective, a Thomist, whether a follower of St. Dominic or a follower of St. Thomas, or perhaps preferably both, is always at war, as there are always errors to be combated and the seed of faith to be defended. There are always souls in danger of damnation and souls to direct to heaven. While St. Dominic's battle with the Albigensian heresy, say, or St. Thomas's battle on two fronts, with opponents of Aristotle II court on one side, and with Latin avarice who held philosophical views at odds with Christian, Christianity as on the mortality of the individual soul on the other, are relatively well known. In this talk, I am going to take us back to 1921, the hundredth anniversary of the Oxford Dominican Priory here on its current site, and of the establishment of the Institute for Thomistic Studies at the Dominican Study House of Le Sauchois in Belgium, and to a civil war brewing within Thomism and within Dante studies, a civil war which would question the very nature of Catholic theology and philosophy with consequences which are felt to the present day um, as, for example, uh, in discussion yesterday in the formation of Dominican novices here. I first briefly analysed the main battlefield, the debates about Aquinas's thought, with particular references to the controversy about Christian philosophy. I then turned to the skirmishes in the field of Dante studies between scholars such as the French Dominicans Joachim Berthier, 1848 to 1924, and Pierre Mandonet, 1858 to 1936, who presented Dante as fundamentally a Thomist and Catholic theologian poet, and those such as the lay historians Bruno Nardi and Etienne Gilson, who deconstructed what they saw as the myth of Dante Thomist and saw a fundamental disharmony between Dante and Aquinas's thought. As I show through the work of the English Dominican Canon Foster, who may be, well, perhaps not known to some of you here, it was the latter view that emerged victorious, influencing post-war Dante scholarship to the present. In light of this intellectual history in the final part, I reappraise eight key alleged points of divergence between Dante and Aquinas's thought, or at least some of those. So, first of all, a civil war in Thomism. Mandonet and Gilson on Aquinas and Christian philosophy. In 1921, 700 years after the death of his founder, St. Dominic, the French Dominican Pierre Mandonet helped to launch a new historical institute for Thomistic studies. Having entered the Dominican order in 1882, Mandonet had been professor of history at the University of Freiburg from 1891 to 1918, and on retirement he continued to research and teach at the Dominican study house of Le Sauchois in Belgium. Mandonet was an outstanding historian and theologian, author, for example, of important volumes on Siege of Brabant, and collaborator on the critical edition of Aquinas' works commissioned by Pope Leo XIII as editor, for example, of Aquinas' huge commentary on the sentences. One of the giants of medieval studies and founder and honorary president of the French Societe Thomiste, Mandonet's name was synonymous with fundamental research into the thought and writing of Thomas Aquinas. One of the pressing purposes of the foundation of the Institut Historique d'Etudes Thomistes in 1921, or December 1920, 
yeah, kind of 1921, um, was to provide a properly historical approach to Aquinas's thought, which would refute the alarming assertions of those outside the Dominican order who were, on the view of its founders, abusing the historical method to undermine the true sense of Aquinas's doctrine. The founders note in France alone the recent work of Pierre Duhem, the physicist and historian of medieval science, and the alarming claims of Jean Duintel, presumably referring to his St. Thomas and Pseudo Dionysus Denis, sorry, of 1919, and Etienne Gilson, presumably referring to L'Etomisme, also of 1919, where already Gilson's thesis of Christian philosophy is evident in germ. Etienne Gilson, 1884 to 1978, would become, of course, one of the most important 20th century interpreters of Aquinas and historians of the medieval period as a whole. And yet, the Dominicans founding the Historical Institute of Thomistic Studies at Le Sauchois in 1921 were right, I think, to be aware of the threat posed by him to at least their tradition of Thomism. Reflecting back at the beginning of this century on the debates of the 1920s and 1930s, the philosopher Ralph McInerney highlights Gilson's generalized attack on the Dominican order, the great commentators, and the Ecole Thomiste as it existed both prior to and after Leo XIII's Eterni Patris. One Dominican then who rose to defend, in his view, the sacred vine of Thomism against the thorns of Gilson in the 1920s and 1930s was Pierre Mandonet. This is particularly evident from the famous controversy about Christian philosophy. Laurent Schuch notes that as far back as 1924, Mandonet had taken strong exception to the term Christian philosophy in his review of Gilson's La Philosophie de Saint Bonaventure. Gilson's presentation of Bonaventure as an anti-Thomist Christian philosopher was unacceptable to his friends De Wolf and Mandonet. In his review, Mandonet insists that St. Thomas alone among medieval thinkers had provided a proper rational basis for thought and if there were to be a model for a Christian philosopher, it would be St. Thomas. As Schuch comments, moreover, Mandonet had long taken Bonaventure to be a Neoplatonic Augustinian who, in his failure to distinguish the object of theology from the object of philosophy, was not a philosopher at all. For Mandonet, then, there was no such thing, properly speaking, as the philosophy of St. Bonaventure which must have been rather galling for Gilson, as it was the very title of his study. The controversy about Christian philosophy came to a head at a famous debate of the French Société Thomiste in 1933, in which Mandonet and Gilson locked horns as principal antagonists. As McInerney relates, the morning of 11th September 1933 ends with these two great historians having established themselves as opposite poles on the question before them. For Mandonet, a Christian may be a philosopher, but there is no such thing as Christian philosophy. The unity is in the subject alone. To think or argue from faith is to do theology. To argue from reason and the natural world is to do philosophy. There may be in an individual a de facto union of philosophy and faith, but de jure, by right, there is not. For Mandonet, then, Gilson's historical recovery and advocacy of a Christian philosophy was an essentially retrograde step to the state of medieval thought prior to Aquinas and to the kind of confusion between theology and philosophy that he found in Bonaventure. As McInerney puts it, Christian philosophy involves neglecting the profound work realized by Thomas in discriminating reason and faith and clarifying their interrelations, and it would effectively cut Christian philosophers off from the rest of the thinking world. Mandonet's fellow, Le Sauchois Dominican, Antonin Gilbert Cetelange, founder in 1893 of the Revue Thomiste and author of a two-volume study of Aquinas' philosophy in 1910, similarly distinguishes the order of discovery from the order of demonstration, 
The influence of Christianity can be assigned to the order of discovery, but in the order of demonstration, either an argument is good or it isn't. For Gilson, by contrast, the Christian faith had a material effect on philosophy, not only in the order of discovery, but in the order of demonstration, such that philosophy in this tradition is objectively dependent on the Christian faith. Gilson believed that Christian theologians had created a philosophy that was Christian both in its form and its content. From his doctoral work, Gilson had come to believe that in the early modern period, Descartes, but also later Enlightenment philosophers such as Melibranche, Leibniz and Kant, Kant sorry, had built philosophies dependent upon their more or less explicitly acknowledged Christian faith. He then applied this question. Were not many modern philosophers also guilty of building their philosophies on some degree of faith to medieval as well as modern philosophical speculation? Developing his notion of Christian philosophy for the Gifford Lectures of 1931-32 at Aberdeen's militantly Protestant University. Then, uh, Gilson's approach, despite its positive immediate reception by Protestants and some Catholics, threatened both the autonomy of neo-scholastic philosophy and the autonomy of Protestant theology. It would subsequently lead to the relativism of Thomist, classical realist, Aristotelian philosophy, as a mere competing tradition of philosophy, as, for example, in the subsequent Gifford Lectures, 1988, of Alistair McIntyre, published as three rival versions of moral inquiry in 1990. So there's a civil war in Thomist studies. Now, a civil war within Dante's studies. Mandan and Gilson did not agree about Aquinas. They also did not agree about Dante. And it is little surprise then that they did not agree about the relationship between Dante's and Aquinas's thought. Their respective interpretations of each and their interrelation, however, tell us a lot about their approach to Catholic theology and philosophy as a whole. And they also deeply influence subsequent Thomism and Dante studies. So, Joachim Berthier, Pierre Mandonet, and the Thomist Dante. Having published short articles on Dante throughout his academic life, Mandonet published Dante the Theologian, Dante the Theologian, in 1935, shortly before his death on the 4th of January 1936. Mandonet's dual interest in Aquinas and Dante paralleled that of a Dominican colleague at Freuburg, 10 years his senior, Joachim Joseph Berthier, 1848 to 1924. An accomplished medieval historian who published important works on the early masters of the Dominican order, Humbert of Romans and Jordan of Saxony, and Thomist, who also collaborated on the Leonine edition of Aquinas' works and published a series of Thomist scholastic manuals. Berthier translated Dante's Commedia into French and published a two-volume edition of the Inferno in Italian with scholastic commentary in 1892, as well as a series of articles on the poet. As Rudy Imbach notes, Berthier Mandonet's labours testify to a new Catholic impulsion to Dante studies, symbolically given papal approval by the removal of Dante's Monarchia from the Index of Prohibited Books in 1881, where it had remained since 1554, and which paralleled the Renaissance in Thomistic studies instigated by Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Eterni Patris in 1879. Thus, Berthier dedicates his commentary on the Inferno to Pope Leo XIII, Mercenate Insigne dei Studi Thomistici e Danteschi, eminent patron of Thomistic and Dante studies, and inserts on its title page an image of St. Thomas in his teaching chair, with Dante standing next to him, listening. Although Dante was nine when Aquinas himself died, the intended signification of this visual representation is not altogether fanciful. In the Convivio, Dante represents himself as listening to the wise and gathering the crumbs from their table and relates how he went to the disputations of the schools of the religious, the Dominicans at Santa Maria Novella and the Franciscans at Santa Croce. Berti and Mandone both see Dante as first and foremost a brilliant scholar and synthesizer. His true originality is to be found not in his doctrine, 
the shared patrimony of all the great minds of that astonishing Christian Europe of the 13th century, but in his mastery of poetic form. Dante's original greatness does not reside in the content of his work, but in his extraordinary poetic technique, which synthesizes this material in an immense, finely detailed and harmonious poem of beautiful unity and perfect proportion, with connections between all its major themes and grace and truth in its smallest details. Although well aware of other sources of influence, Berthier understands Dante's philosophical studies as principally following Aristotle, especially interpreted through Aquinas' commentary, commentaries, and his study of theology as also primarily following the teachings of St. Thomas. Mandanet, though, further distinguishes between the sources and the shape of Dante's thought, addressing critically the universally established custom of placing Dante's theories in parallel with those of Aquinas, Mandalay underlines that such correspondences, however fruitful, do not imply a formal Thomism because St. Thomas is not simply a great leader of a school, but above all, the representative of Catholic teaching. St. Thomas hence finds common ground with all the great theologians and his primary achievement was to better order this teaching and evidence it more perfectly. While Mandonet notes that Dante as a layman and an impoverished exile may have had to search for solutions to certain problems in whatever theological sources were at hand, he nonetheless maintains that where possible Dante drew on Aquinas' works and where this was not possible, Dante conformed his thought to the one who was, in his eyes, his master. Although there may be differences here or there on questions of secondary importance, Mandonet insists that Dante follows Aquinas on key points of contested doctrine in the 13th century, and that the commentators are therefore on the right tracks who compare the doctrine of the great theologian and of the great poet to shed light on both. So, Bruno Nardi and the myth of the Thomas Dante. It is this universal opinion among Dante scholars that Dante faithfully followed the teachings of St. Thomas, against which the lay scholars Bruno Nardi and Etienne Gilson reacted polemically. Both Nardi and Gilson situated their own arguments about Dante as specific refutations of those of Pierre Mandonet, and more generally, as attacking what they saw as the myth of the Thomas Dante. The subject of Bruno Nardi's doctoral dissertation, Sigur de Brabant, dans la Divine Comédie et les sources de la philosophie de Dante in 1911, was prompted by his reading of Mandonet's work on Sigur and the avarism of the 13th century. The title page of Mandonet's work features one of the two tercets about Sigur's place in Dante's heaven of Christian wisdom. This is the eternal light of Sigieri who, reading in the Vico degli Strami, demonstrated enviable truths. Mandonet emphasizes the exceptional place assigned by Dante to Sigur of Brabant as an unequivocal sign of his estimation for him and as the cause of considerable scholarly attention in the commentary tradition. Why does Dante elevate Sigur in this way? Mandonet explicitly opposes the hypothesis that by elevating Sigur, Dante was ironically subverting the Dominicans. Instead, for Mandonet, Dante desired, desired to place examples of celebrated philosophers who were not also theologians in his heaven of the wise, a prescription which limited the choice, and Sigur of Brabant and Boethius of Dacia are his examples of masters who were exclusively philosophers. Mandonet argues that Dante probably had little knowledge of the specific Averroes doctrines of Sigur of Brabant that he documents in his study, and he opposes the attempt by Dante amateurs to use subsequent historical knowledge of Sigur as a favoured argument in a wider emphasis on Dante as a heretic or heterodox thinker. On Mandonet's view, Dante places Sigur in the heaven of the wise as a representative of philosophy and as a defender of the autonomy of philosophy from theology and the arts faculty from the theology faculty. 
his enviable truths referring to some of his philosophical theses attacked by Bishop Tempier in the condemnation of 1277. In this general respect, in other words, as defending the relative autonomy of philosophy, philosophy Sija is on the same side of the debate as St. Thomas, St. Albert the Great, and the Dominicans as a whole. By contrast, Bruno Nardi develops as the argument of his doctoral thesis what Mandone had dismissed as the amateur reading of Sija as implying a heterodoxy in Dante's own thought. Where Mandone downplays Dante's knowledge of Sija's avaristic thesis documented in his study, the doctoral student Nardi emphasizes them as central to Dante's syncretist thought. On Nardi's view, Dante's celebration of Sija in the Heaven of the Wise implies his particular intellectual sympathy for these Latin Averroist theses. Sija does not stand for the general autonomy of philosophy from theology, but rather for the more specific division within the Aristotelian philosophers themselves between the Latin Averroists and the Thomists which Dante in his original poetic synthesis would eventually overcome. Deriving from Mandone a picture of the world of Latin Averroism that Sija inhabited, Nardi makes this the backdrop for his understanding of Dante's own early philosophical culture, as reflected in the second part of Mandone's title, Sija of Brabant and 13th century Averroism, which becomes in Nardi, Sija Brabant, and the sources of Dante's philosophy. As Paolo Falzoni highlights, this underpins Nardi's presentation of Dante's intellectual trajectory as a convert from a period of life in which he sympathized with those Arabic Aristotelian views of which Sija of Brabant was the famous champion, an intellectual sympathy which caused the frightening chasm he was digging within his mind between the philosopher's exigencies and the aspirations of the believer, to the reorientation of his philosophical opinions towards their theological reinterpretation in a new and original Christian synthesis with the abandonment of the convivio and the writing of the Commedia. Okay, so now Etienne Gilson and Dante as Christian philosopher, not Thomas theologian. If Nardi's lifelong approach to Dante was stimulated by his antagonistic interpretation of Mandoni's scholarship on Sija, what Kenan Foster called Gilson's brilliant raid into Dante territory with Dante and Philosophy, 1939, subsequently translated into English as Dante the Philosopher, 1946, was nothing other than a book-length refutation of Mandone's Dante the Theologian, 1935, not yet translated in English. Well, um, I'm working on this with a colleague, um, Patricia um, Kelly, and typically referred to, if at all, in English language scholarship through Gilson's caricature. If Nardi's interpretation of Dante was influenced by his idealistic prejudices, then Gilson's interpretation of Dante and Aquinas was influenced by his polemical repudiation of the Thomist tradition and his own innovative understanding of Christian philosophy. Indeed, in Dante and Philosophy, Gilson explicitly asks, is the philosophy of Dante a Christian philosophy? Where, as we've seen, Mandone in Dante the Theologian presents Dante as essentially a Thomist theologian poet, Gilson follows Nardi in presenting Dante as a thinker strongly influenced by Latin avarism in his early maturity, they both erroneously date Dante's Convivio and Monarchia to this period, who then, due to an intellectual conversion, provided an original and non-Thomistic synthesis in the Commedia. Like Nardi, Gilson appeared to understand by Latin avarism, not simply particular heterodox interpretations of Aristotle, such as on the eternity of the world or the unicity of the potential intellect, but also the general autonomy of philosophy and theology and reason and faith. It is this strict division which Gilson critiques as heterodox in the Duo Ultima, the two final ends of Dante's Monarchia, according to which man has two ethical goals in this life, 
an earthly beatitude attainable by the teachings of the philosophers, the temporal sphere of the holy emperor, and an eternal supernatural beatitude attainable by the teachings of Christian revelation, the spiritual sphere of the Pope. Where for Mandanay, the autonomy between philosophy and theology and reason and faith is central to Aquinas' thought itself and institutionally to the contested autonomy of the faculties of the arts and divinity in the University of Paris, for Gilson, as we've seen, orthodox philosophy, including preeminently Aquinas' philosophy, is in fact a Christian philosophy, a philosophy Christian in its form and content. What Gilson critiques in this general respect, in other words, the autonomy of philosophy as Dante's Latin avarism, is simply, according to Mandanay's perspective, constitutive of Thomism properly understood. Gilson's interpretation of Aquinas and Dante is strongly inflected by his political outlook and particularly his conviction in the early 1930s that Latin avarism, which Nardi and Gilson associate with Dante's prose works, had fractured the hope of a unified Christian social order. Gilson is opposed to the separation between philosophy and theology because he sees the political divorce between reason and faith as underpinning the French Republic's educational programme of secularisation and the separation between church and state. By contrast, Gilson envisages Christianity as the foundation of a unified society. He writes, God turns all men into brothers and children of the same father and into God's servants in a shared religion. And because this religion established as the necessary condition for reaching a supernatural end, the practice of justice of the moral law of charity, it supplied the only rules which make possible man's obtaining happiness in this world. As his intellectual biographer Schuch comments, according to Gilson, this dream of a great Christian social order had been broken by an avarism which had decreed faith and reason to be irreconcilable and which had established two empires, the one directed by the Pope, the other dependent upon princes. Gilson's historical critique of the duo ultima, the two final ends in Dante's Monarchia, is mediated then by the very different, but apparently parallel, political situation in France with the strict division between church and state. Canon Foster and the subsequent reception of Dante's philosophy and theology. The scholarship of Bruno Nardi and Etienne Gilson underpins the 20th and even 21st century reception of Dante's philosophy and theology and of the relationship between Dante and Aquinas' thought. For example, the most influential post-war North American scholar, Charles Singleton, sim simply notes that one surely thinks of Etienne Gilson and Bruno Nardi as our masters in this, in medieval philosophy. Gilson's and Nardi's influence is perhaps best seen, however, through the scholarship of the English Dante scholar, the Dominican Kenan Foster, 1910-1986, who became the undisputed post-war authority on Dante's theology in English and Italian scholarship, entrusted, for example, with the most important theological entries in the Encyclopedia Dantesca, 1970-75, on Christ, God, theology, the Gospel, Aquinas and the Summa Contra Gentiles. Whether mediated by Foster or not, however, Nardi's and Gilston's subsequent influence on the understanding of Dante and Aquinas' thought was and is widespread and persistent. Kenan Foster concluded then that it has become increasingly evident that Dante cannot be called a Thomist in any strict sense of the term as denoting a body of doctrine characteristic of St. Thomas. Dante's universe was neither Thomist nor anti-Thomist, and was instead a rather uneasy synthesis of Neoplatonist and Aristotelian elements. In this final section of my talk then, I shall reappraise and re-examine in light of the reception history just analysed, some of the eight key divergences between Dante and Aquinas' thought alleged by Nardi, Gilson and Foster, and I've listed all of these on the handout. I show how competing interpretations of Aquinas 
lead to con competing interpretations of Dante, and also how Nardi, Gilston and Foster rely on a rather literalist account of Dante's work, rather than the more nuanced and arguably more historically informed hermeneutic approach of Mandone. So first of all, the natural desire for the beatific vision. For Foster, Gilson and Nardi, Dante's most clearly non-Thomistic thesis is that man does not have a natural desire for the beatific vision. To support this view, they cite Dante's convivio, what God is, is not something we naturally desire to know. And for contrast, Aquinas' summa contra gentiles, the natural desire to know does not rest in that knowledge of God whereby we know merely that he is. There are two issues here, one about their interpretation of Dante and the other about their interpretation of Aquinas. With regard to Dante's convivio, they ignore the procedural point that in this passage, Dante is approaching the question philosophically, not theologically, and is responding to a specific objection to the earthly happiness, the life of philosophical contemplation he is describing. Namely, how can philosophical wisdom make a man happy if there are objects of the intellect which he knows exist but cannot know perfectly? In other words, know their essence. Dante argues as follows. First, natural desire is proportioned to the capacity of the agent desiring. Second, nature would be in vain if an agent in desiring its, in, its perfection were to desire its imperfection. Third, knowledge of God's essence, not that God exists, but what and who God is, is not proportionate to human nature and is only naturally proportionate to God. And therefore, we do not naturally desire the beatific vision, in other words, to see God face to face. The second issue is that they take Aquinas's position on this question as self-evident, whereas in fact it was one of the most contentious problems in the history of 20th century Catholic thought, and they quote as evidence for it two passages from Aquinas's Summa Theologiae and Summa Contra Gentiles, where Aquinas is approaching the same question theologically. In De Veritate, by contrast, Aquinas speaks of the beatific vision as exceeding the proportion of human nature because the natural powers are not sufficient for attaining or thinking or desiring it, a position in harmony with Dante's philosophical position just discussed. As the historian Frederick Cobbleston comments, St. Thomas in De Veritate does not admit a natural desire in the strict sense for the vision of God. And it seems only reasonable to suppose that when in the Summa Theologica and Summa Contra Gentiles he speaks of a natural desire for the vision of God, he is not speaking strictly as a philosopher, but as a theologian and philosopher combined, that is, presupposing the supernatural order and interpreting the data of experience in the light of that presupposition. In this regard, McInerney highlights Cayetan's distinction between two ways of considering man's desire for the beatific vision. First, as pertaining to man's nature, it is not natural. Second, as pertaining to man ordered to a supernatural end, it is natural. Aquinas's passage in De Veritate should be understood in the first sense, as should Dante's passage in Convivio III, whereas the passages in the Summa Theologiae and Summa Contra Gentiles cited by Nardi, Gilson and Foster, should be understood in the second sense. Rather than a necessary and certain contradiction between Dante and Aquinas then, what is at stake here are two rival interpretations of Aquinas's thought. Etienne Gilson considered absolutely perfect Henri de Lubac's thesis in Le Mystère du Surnaturel that, according to Aquinas, Man has a natural desire for the beatific vision in both senses, a desire only grace can accomplish. However, de Lubac and Gilson were reacting against the mainstream Thomist tradition of the time, according to which man is made for a natural happiness in such a way that if he is called to the vision of God, as he is, 
such a grace can only be superadded. The theory thus denies that man, in sense one, has a natural desire for supernatural beatitude, the aspiration for which is due to a grace specifically Christian. Okay, that's the first um, uh, contested thesis. So, number two, this one's shorter. Dante's imperialist argument for the Holy Roman Empire with universal and complete temporal power. Etienne Gilson highlights the striking contrast between Dante's and Aquinas' political thought. In Monarchia, Dante writes, For the sovereign pontiff, vicar of our Lord Jesus Christ and Peter's successor, to whom we owe what is due, not of Christ, but of Peter. In De Regimine Principum, Aquinas writes, The sovereign priest Peter's successor, the vicar of Christ, the Roman pontiff, to whom all the kings of the Christian people owe submission, as to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. However, in observing this contrast, Gilson is only reiterating what Berthier and Mandanet had both underlined as a heterodox and non-Thomistic element in Dante's thought. Thus, Berthier considered wildly idealistic, dangerous in its time, and clearly erroneous, Dante's practical application of the twofold end of man, natural and supernatural, to support his imperialist argument for the complete temporal sovereignty of a Holy Roman Emperor in Monarchia, and that the Dominican Guido Vernani and the Church was quite right to refute and condemn this thesis shortly after Dante's death in 1328. Mandanay similarly contextualizes Dante's imperialist utopianism, excusing it with reference to the political passions, unjust exile and disappointments of Dante in his time. The removal of Dante's Monarchia from the Index in 1881 was in no way a belated recognition that Dante's political vision had in fact been correct. Nonetheless, times had moved on and the Church arguably did not want to dampen by this censure the enthusiasm for Dante as the Christian poet of the Commedia. Notwithstanding Dante's heterodox political vision, it is the theological and philosophical doctrines of the Commedia overall that Mandone and Berthier consider sound and in general harmony with Aquinas' teaching. According to Gilson, Navi and Foster, however, not only Dante's imperial political theology, but the ethical theory of the two ends of man, the duo ultima, that underpins it, sets him at odds with Aquinas' own moral thought. Dante's dualism and the temporal final goal which it implies are excluded in advance by St. Thomas. Gilson claims that not only, as far as we know, did St. Thomas never speak of dual ultima, nor in the sense of duplex finis, but his doctrine excludes even the possibility of their existence. By contrast, however, Patrick Gardner has argued that behind very different political application lies an instructive agreement in principle between Aquinas and Dante namely this distinction between two ultimate ends or goods for man. Once again, the issue concerns selecting one passage in Aquinas' work without regard to others and failing to distinguish between the procedural approaches of them both. While Gilson relies on a citation from Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentiles to imply a single ultimate end, in De Veritate, Aquinas articulates in a different context a twofold ultimate end to man. McInerney paraphrases the key passages as follows. There is, Thomas observes, a twofold ultimate end of man, the ultimate end being what first engages the will. One such end is proportioned to human nature and man's natural powers suffice for attaining it. This is the happiness of which philosophers speak, whether contemplative, which lies in the activity of wisdom, or active, which consists first in the act of prudence and consequently in the acts of the other virtues. But there is another good that is disproportionate to human nature and our natural powers do not suffice for the attaining of it, either for knowing it or for desiring it. It is promised by the divine liberality alone. While Thomas traditionally differentiate between man's natural and his supernatural end, 20th century followers of the Jesuit Henri de Lubac ignore or downplay evidence such as this to the contrary. Therefore, although Dante's heterodox political vision was opposed to that of Aquinas, the extent to which the underpinning theory of 
the duo ultima is opposed to Aquinas, and a lay and worldly aspect of Dante's thought, as for Foster, will depend on our interpretation of Aquinas's thought itself. Right, I'm just going to do one more point of distinction, then I'll leave the rest for the, the handout. So this is the relationship between philosophy and theology. For Gilson, Bruno Nardi was right to see as a strict consequence of Dante's doctrine of the duo ultima, moreover, a particular approach to philosophy. Bruno Nardi, with great shrewdness, has seen and pointed out that there is a disagreement here between Dante and St. Thomas, and that this difference implies another regarding the nature of philosophy itself. I am convinced that he is entirely right on this point, and even that what he says is an incontestable and an obvious historical fact. With regard to this relationship between philosophy and theology, we see again how contemporary debates in Thomism shaped competing interpretations of Dante. Gilson had strenuously defended Marie Dominique Chenu, who at a relatively early point in his career had seemed to undermine Aquinas' philosophy and its place in the training of theologians. Two of the ten propositions Chenu was asked to accept in Rome, for example, concern the autonomy of philosophy and theology and the necessity for the theologian of philosophical study. Gilson had similarly eroded the distinction dear to the traditional Thomist school between philosophy and theology with his own novel interpretation of Christian philosophy. Indeed, Gilson's interpretation of Dante's trajectory from the dualism between philosophy and theology in the prose works to the alleged Christian synthesis of the Commedia is, in essence, a cultural mapping onto Dante of this wider agenda for 20th century Christian philosophy and following Chenu for a new school and new curriculum of theology. By contrast, Berthier maintains the traditional Thomas position that Catholic theology does not admit of intrinsic change and includes within it a philosophy subject to the dictates of reason conforming to the faith and therefore in say immutable. To Dante's sacred poem, both heaven and earth have set their hand, and in continuity with the early commentators, Berthier and Mandonet interpret these lines to indicate that Dante distinguishes between and draws upon both philosophy, which derives its principles from below, and Christian revelation, which derives its principles from above. Mandonet affirms, indeed, that the great achievement of 13th century theology was to place every field of intellectual endeavour then known in contact with the revealed order. Theology is a universal science which the Commedia holds altogether, everything in the revealed order and in the purely human order, in faith and in science in the domain of thought, in grace and in nature and the order of reality. Dante's epic is the poem of human destiny in light of Christian teaching, the theme of the great 13th century works of theology about man's fall, restoration and return to God. The natural and supernatural orders, the orders of nature and of grace, are nonetheless distinct and irreducible in themselves. It is for this reason that with regard to the speculative knowledge, Mandonet identifies Dante's Virgil with philosophy, while he identifies Dante's Beatrice specifically with revealed truth, faith and the light of glory. In the Commedia it is Dante's Aquinas, not Beatrice, who represents for Mandonet Christian theology, which brings together the truths of reason and Christian revelation into a formal synthesis. Thus, where Kenan and Foster, in particular, saw the dichotomy between Dante's Virgil and Beatrice as setting Dante at antipodes with Aquinas and creating a deeply problematic tension in the poem between two Dantes, the title of his book on Dante. Mandonet understands Dante's Virgil and Beatrice as his poetic solution to the challenge of representing in the speculative order of knowledge the Thomistic autonomy of truths from reason and from revelation, truths which find in Christian theology, in Dante's Commedia, in Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, their integration without thereby losing their distinction. So I'll just skip over those uh, four others because it'd be nice to move on to um, some um, questions, but I'm happy to come back on, on those as well. So let me just summarize some key overarching points of this reappraisal of Dante's thought. First, Pierre Mandonet takes a critical perspective 
to the university-established custom of placing Aquinas' theories in parallel with those of Dante. He understands Thomism in an intentionally broad sense, Aquinas' primary achievement being to order and evidence more fully a substantially common Catholic teaching, despite important points of difference, of the leading theologians of the period, and Mandane underlines the potential variety and limitations of Dante's sources, while nonetheless insisting that, on major points of contested doc theological doctrine, Dante, Dante typically follows the shape of Aquinas' thought. Second, Bruno Nardi and Etienne Gilson, the most influential thinkers on Dante's thought in the 20th and 21st century, had highly contentious interpretations of both Dante and Aquinas, and set these interpretations in reaction against the theses specifically of Mandane and arguably of the Thomist mainstream as a whole. By focusing on those Dante theses that Nardi, Gilson and Foster considered especially irreconcilable with Aquinas' thought, I've suggested that the situation may be more complex and involve competing understandings of Aquinas as well as of Dante. Thus, for example, what Dante scholars still see as his clearly most non-Thomistic thesis, that man does not have a natural desire for the beatific vision, is understood in a qualified way as pertaining philosophically to man's nature, in potential harmony with the traditional Thomist view of Aquinas' thought. I've also tried to show that Berthier and Mandane are ultimately less concerned about from where Dante received his doctrine, his sources, and more concerned about whether his doctrine is true. And it is in this latter respect especially that they see the general harmony between Dante's thought, Thomism, and Catholic doctrine. Thank you very much. George, um, I have a question from online. Um, one of the viewers asked, could you comment further on the banning of De Monarchia? When, why, and uh, was it questioned before? And was it? Was it questioned before it was? Was it? Before it was taken off the book, before it was taken again off the internet, before any. Okay, yes. Um, Yes, so, I mean, the context of Dante's Monarchia is um, incessant civil strife um, in the Italian peninsula um, and beyond, um, still between um, the, the church's temporal power and um, the Holy em uh, Roman Empire. Um, and uh, Italian cities would tend to divide between those who are aligned um, so sort of Ghibellines or Guelphs with um, uh, imperial or papal claims. Um, and particularly in his exile, uh, Dante really uh, comes to side very strongly with this imperial side and imperial propaganda. So um, um, I think a, a big reason for the um, uh, the burning of Monarchia soon after his death, I mean, it's only seven years after his death, is that Dante's Monarchia is being used as imperial propaganda. Um, and that was a very you know, real threat. Only um, a few years after his death, um, you have the descent of Louis IV into Italy and the uh, raising of an anti-pope. So, um, so I think that the kind of the official church's response to Monarchia is, is, is just a very real um, practical one. Um, but the Dominican task with kind of dismantling monarchia uh, intellectually, so one way is just to burn it, and they publicly burn it, but they also um, have the decency to, to try and say, well, why they're burning it. Um, and when Guido Vernani does this in his De Reprobatio uh, Monarchia Composite at uh, Dante Alighieri, something like that, in the refutation of um, Dante's monarchia, um, there's, there are um, some kind of absurd arguments that Dante has that, that Guido Bernani unpicks. But I think overall, um, 
uh, overall, the issue of Dante's monarchy, as I see it, but also of his political theology in general, is, is simply that it is just wildly utopian. I mean, he, he basically believes that um, if you had a universal Holy Roman Emperor who possessed all of land, all the land there was, he therefore wouldn't be avaricious because there'd be no more <laughs> land for him to possess. And therefore he'd act justly and distribute things. And this would kind of sort out the incessant battles between kings and, and princes for the world. Now, I think that's not a very sensible thing. I, I think if Dante were the Holy Roman Emperor, I'm sure he would do that and he would act justly. But I mean, Mandane and Berthier are quite kind of amusing about Dante in this thing. They say he wasn't a very good politician. He was too idealistic. He was too theoretical. He was too much of a scholar to be a good politician. And it's just not very practical. Mm. Thank yeah. you. I was just thinking then, um... I suppose when the monarchy was taken off the index in the yeah. 19th century, um, well, there was no longer any Holy Roman Empire after the Napoleonic Wars, so I suppose that may be a factor. I think it's a fact. I mean, of course, you just had the um, reunification of Italy in 1870, and there Dante was taken as a kind of um, cultural icon for Risorgimento, which a lot of it was very anti-clerical and very anti-church. And so you get this emergence of the kind of secular Dante who embodies the Italian state. And that's why if you go to Italy, there's Piazza Dante and statues of Dante everywhere. And I think the problem with having the Monarchia on the index is it confirmed that narrative. It's like Dante's on the index of prohibited books. So I think the reason they took Dante off wasn't because they thought Monarchia uh, was true or, or right or in any sense. It was just to get out of that narrative and say, yes, he got his politics wrong. That was because the particular historical circumstances in which he lived. But the Commedia of the, the Whole is not heterodox. It's, it's a wonderful Christian poem. And, and so the church wanted to kind of reclaim Dante from, from that narrative. But you're right, also, the, the threat of Holy Roman Empire wasn't that far. But then if you think about Mussolini, you know, he, he decided to set up his own little empire. So um, yeah, yeah, these things can always come back. So, John, yeah. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so, that all seems to make sense of a particular date, which you actually just pointed to. He, Mandate writes in 35. Europe, Catholics are basically all divided between the communists versus the fascists, or the fascist Hitlerism. And I can see Gilson and Nardi thinking, okay, basically, Dante's giving an apologia for Mussolini, and you got stopped. I mean, how much of that is going on, do you think, with Gilson? I think it's the other way around. Um, Nardi is a committed fascist, um, and so um, he... Um, and he also um, was kind of patronized by Giovanni Gentile, who was uh, kind of the most important intellectual of fascism. Um, so, um, yes, uh, I think it's the other way around. Oh, he, he wanted to kind of reconcile the church with the empire. And he thought they could be integrated, fascism could be integrated with the church in the 30s. Is that what Nardi was arguing? Um, uh, trying to see the relationship between the politics and the theology. Yeah, no, I mean, it just it just is is the case that Nardi was uh, a fascist. And also, I mean, one of the problems for Nardi is that because he was an ex-priest as well, he couldn't get a position at a university in Italy. And so he had to get sort of special um, dispensation to eventually um, be able to take a university post. Um, but, I mean, the reason that uh, the Dominicans, Berthier, uh, 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 Mandane, and Le Souchois in um, Belgium is precisely because of the political upheaval in, in France and, and, and the French Republic. Um, so, yes, I mean, you're right that the, the, the thing about Dante is he gets appropriated by everyone, which is quite a good thing in some ways. So um, it's certainly the case that there is a Dante fascist that's constructed by Mussolini. Um, but fortunately, people like Gramsci also love Dante, and he's uh, the kind of propagandist of communism. So because everyone seems to love Dante, and of course the liberals love Dante as well, so luckily he doesn't just get associated with one regime, and so he's able to survive that, um, that, that problem. So you're, you're, uh, you said you were translating um, Mandane, so you must think it's still very much worth reading. Um, does this mean that we should downgrade the Lubach contribution? Do you think in some way that he is overvalued in this? Yes, um, the, is the short answer. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, the project I'm doing is such a collaborate, collaboration with my colleague Patricia Kelly in, in St. Andrews. Um, so we're working on, on, on this together. 
Um, um, and she's principally in charge of the translation, but obviously I'm a sort of Dante scholar. I know the, the sort of scholastic context. Um, and so we, we've had these wonderful kind of every Thursday during lockdown, we were meeting and going through the translation. Um, but that's right. I think that the history of 20th century Thomism um, has tended to emphasize uh, those who went against the church orthodoxy um, and, and then became a new orthodoxy um, like Chenu and de Lubac and has tended to um, be quite dismissive of the generation of Dominicans that came before them. And I think that um, uh, there are these exceptional scholars um, who, who really were the true beginners of uh, the kind of historical study of Aquinas' work, for example, and they've been slightly um, uh, forgotten in some sense, not least because someone like Etienne Gilson was right at the top of the French academic system. He was a brilliant self-propagandist. He wrote a tremendous amount. He helped with Chenu to found PIMS. And I think particularly in academia, um, you know, people quite liked those who are rubbing against the church. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think, I think there does need to be a kind of reappraisal of that whole period um, because, because I think we all, we all think, oh, well, Chanou was right. And he, all these silly people like Garigou Lagrange in Rome or whatever, they're sort of great. Um, but I, I, in my view, um, th these, people were, these people have been very mischaracterized by Gilson and Chanou and others. Are you going to revive Garigou Lagrange too? Well, I think he's already being revived a bit, but I think he, I think he, I think he needs to be because what we need, I think the problem is we tend to learn about these figures through Gilson or Chenu, and they're very unreliable writers. I mean, that's what I, that's what made me interested in Mandanay's book, is that Gilson's book, Dante in Philosophy, is the book. It, it, all Dante scholars, if they go to philosophy, they go to Gilson, because Gilson's the great historian of the medieval period, and he writes his book on Dante, so we'll go there. On every single undergraduate list, Dante philosophy. But that book is a polemical refutation. The whole book is literally a polemical refutation of Mandanay's book, never translated, never, you know, hardly ever read. But in reading Gilson, I could see he's completely misrepresenting, and mischaracterizing uh, Mandanay. And, and my sense is that um, that, make, that makes me less uh, trusting in Gilson and some of these other thinkers uh, as well. And, and um, you know, for example, you have to think, well, they're just these scholastics, it's just scholastics, and they don't have any sense of history. They're historians. They set up an institute of the historical study of Aquinas. So there's a lot of mischaracterization, and, and I think there does need to be a reappraisal there. Um, and also a, a kind of sense of more piety on the part of Dominicans for, um, uh, for those uh, inheritors, because there can just be the center to sort of write off, and then, then luckily it all got thrown away and we got this new theology. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, those people were very holy and, and faithful scholars, and, and they're worth um, assessing on their own terms and reading, I think. Yeah. That's right. Um, th this puts me very at the fringes of Dante's studies, <laughs> is the true answer. Um, uh, I mean, my colleagues, we just had a conference in Cambridge and Oxford on Friday and Saturday, are, are interested in what I'm doing. And, and when part of the reason this, this, this um, translation we're doing of Mandane's uh, Dante in Theology, Dante the theologian, I'm, I'm writing a very long introduction of 15,000 words. So we're not just giving it to people. So the, the purpose of that introduction is to show uh, how Mandanay's ideas were traduced by Gilson, but also how they um, challenge contemporary understandings of Dante. So it's, it's not simply a kind of handing over, it's also. And so I think that's what I'm always trying to do. Obviously, I'm a Dante scholar, so I know the tendencies in the field. Um, and then I'm retrieving these earlier voices from you might call the kind of Leonine revival of, 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 of Dante studies, but very much um, putting them in dialogue with um, contemporary Dante studies. I mean, I haven't talked about this today, um, but because you mentioned Barolini's de Dante, 
Barolini, um, the whole of that, that thesis, which is very um, dominant, takes as its starting point Bruno Nardi. Um, and it takes as its starting point Bruno Nardi's idea that Dante's whole Divine Comedy is not an allegory of the poets, but it's a prophetic vision. Right? Bruno Nardi believed that Dante actually had a vision of the Inferno, Purgatorio, and the Paradiso, and recorded it in a vision. And Barolini starts a book by saying, Dante scholars haven't taken this seriously enough. We have to accept everything in the Divine Comedy, all the encounters, as if they're true, or as they're true, as Dante. In other words, the literal sense of Dante's Divine Comedy is literally true. I think that is completely wrong. <laughs> but the problem is, both you know, Bruno Nardi is so influential, and then you get that prophetic vision. Then you get the whole Singletonian school, you probably would have studied, which talks about the allegory of the theologians, that Dante writes his poem as if it's the Bible, and so we have to understand the literal sense as if it's true. And so um, the whole of 20th century interpretations of Dante have tended to emphasize that the literal sense of Dante's poem is true. Now, that is really problematic. Right. First of all, I think it's wrong, but it's also really problematic because it means when you get to situations like Dante's strange limbo of the virtuous pagans, you have to think that Dante really believed that in hell, in the limbo traditionally reserved for the unbaptized infants, there are Virgil and Horace and Homer and all these virtuous pagans. Now, if you take that literal understanding as true, Dante automatically becomes a heretic, because that's terrible theology. I mean, Aquinas rules it out as utterly impossible. Um, Augustine rules it out as outrageous presumption, right? They talk about it as a possibility, and they rule it out completely. But someone like Bertie and Mandani, and also the early commentators of Dante's poem, simply say, obviously, Dante here is talking poetice, non theologice. Right? He's talking poetically, non-theologically. They all understand pretty much the literal sense of the poem as a fiction through which one comes to the truth, the theology. So, so I mean, Barolini, de theologizing Dante, takes Bruno Nardi, but I mean, it's another argument. I've just written an article on it in Biblioteca Dantesca, but you know, that's uh, today I've kind of talked about the the content of Dante's work and how you know, we need to sort of reappraise that. But that's really about the hermeneutics of, of the comedy. But again, it shows someone like Barolini who read is following Bruno Nardi. But Bruno Nardi, when he first came up with that prophetic vision, I mean, people like these, these learned scholars are like, you know, where are you? You know, Bruno Nardi, you're off with your head. I mean, you know, what's wrong with you? But the problem is he then became the dominant scholar in Italian um, Dante studies. And everyone reads Dante through him. So, yeah. Join me in saying thank you to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Great. Super.